Welcome to Voice of the Vatican, our top stories. Memorial Day, a solemn mass celebrated near the tomb of U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, calls for prayers the fallen of war on both sides of the lines. Praying for our young, International Children's Day is celebrated in Syria with processions of children carrying icons to the streets of war-torn cities, praying for peace. Social media ecumenism, Catholic Cardinal Vincent Nichols and Anglican Archbishop Justin Welby mix faith and modern communications by going live on Facebook for some Q&A with the faithful. African Martyrs The annual Ugandan Martyrs Day remembers the nearly 50 19th century martyrs put to death in that country for their refusal to deny their love of Christ. Let the children come. Pope Francis calls an audience inside the Vatican with children from marginalized backgrounds, sharing a message of love and hope with the little ones. Helping Hands. Two friends are named Young Australians of 2016 after taking that idea to the streets and building a mobile unit to wash the clothes of the homeless. Jubilee of Priests. More than 6,000 priests from around the world are welcomed to Rome by the Holy Father for three days of priestly formation and renewal. I'm Anne Schneivel, and for Ashley Nerona, you're watching Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV. Past Monday was a time of family and fellowship for Americans as they celebrated the holiday of Memorial Day. Although many primarily think of Memorial Day barbecues, the meaning of the day is much deeper. Originally called Decoration Day from the early tradition of decorating graves with flowers, wreaths, and flags, Memorial Day is a day for remembrance of those who have died in service to the USA. It was first widely observed on May 30, 1868, to commemorate the sacrifices of Civil War soldiers. In the Diocese of Springfield, Illinois, Bishop Thomas Paprocki celebrated the Psalm Memorial Day Mass at the historic Calvary Diocesan Cemetery, which is a stone's throw away from the tomb of the great Abraham Lincoln, president during the U.S. Civil War. In attendance for the celebration were bagpipers and the Knights of Columbus in procession, paying homage to those who have given their lives for the cause of freedom. In his inspiring homily, Bishop Paprocki expounded on the readings from the second book of Maccabees 12, where the Maccabeans prayed for those who had laid down their lives to save the holy city of Jerusalem, and emphasized that, as in Psalm 91, the Lord is our refuge. Bishop Paprocki recalled the conversation of President Lincoln with a Methodist minister during the American Civil War when the minister wondered aloud about the irony that both sides of the war were praying to the same God and reading from the same Bible. When the minister said he hoped that God was on the side of the North, Lincoln was said to have replied that he wasn't concerned as to whether God was on his side, but when looking into his conscience, whether he and his country would be on God's side. Bishop Paprocki recalled John 17, verse 22 to 25, where Christ prayed for unity among men, as is within the Trinity, and challenged all Christians to love and forgive all, even those across enemy lines, just as Christ did on the cross when he forgave those who crucified him. As Bishop James Conley of the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska tweeted this week, the best way to honor our beloved war dead is to pray for their eternal soul. A day of remembrance allows us to stop and give thanks for all who have died around the world for the cause of freedom, but also for all those who died for the faith, and to pray that all souls of the faithful departed may, through God's mercy, rest in peace. At Los Angeles this week in St. Peter's Square, Pope Francis urged the world to join in prayer on International Children's Day with a special thought for children suffering in war-torn Syria. This Wednesday, June 1st, on the occasion of International Children's Day, the Christian community of Syria, both Catholic and Orthodox, will participate together in special prayers for peace. This will have children as the protagonists. The Syrian children invite children from all over the world to unite with them in their prayers for peace. The event gathered hundreds of children from different Catholic rites who led processions in various cities throughout Syria 
including Damascus and Aleppo, which have been ripped apart by war. As a result of five years of Syria's civil war, millions of children have been killed, displaced, or orphaned. In a letter issued by Catholic and Orthodox leaders of the Procession for Peace, they wrote of the trauma experienced by the children of war and their need for spiritual, emotional, and physical healing, saying the children have been, quote, dragged through a cruel war, wounded, traumatized, or even killed. Their tears and their suffering cry out to heaven. During the processions, the children carried the Catholic image of the infant of Prague and the Orthodox icon of the Mother of God of the never-fading rose, in which Our Lady holds her precious son in her arms. Organizers say the presence of the image of the child Jesus brings to mind that, quote, the children in our own home country of Syria are the little brothers and sisters of the suffering child Jesus. We admire the courage and faith of these young Christians who are willing to put their lives on the line for their faith and the cause of peace, while many in safer pastures take their faith for granted. In a recent ecumenical event in England, Catholic Cardinal Vincent Nichols, the Archbishop of Westminster, joined the head of the Anglican Communion, Archbishop Justin Welby, utilizing social media as a means to promote Christian unity. The two clerics hosted a live question and answer session on Facebook, taking questions posted by followers on a Facebook comment thread. The topics included questions on evangelization, prayer, persecution of Christians, Christian unity, and faith. Cardinal Nichols and Archbishop Welby ended the session by together praying a prayer for Christian unity, composed by Shemin Nuf, which calls itself a Catholic community with an ecumenical vocation. The prayer asks the Holy Spirit to, quote, enable us to experience the suffering caused by division, to see our sin, and to hope beyond all hope. The social media experiment was the most recent in a string of many events aimed at fostering unity between the two churches in response to Christ's prayer that they may all be one. June 3rd marked the annual commemoration of Martyrs' Day in Uganda, a day remembering and celebrating the heroic faith of 45 martyrs, both Catholic and Protestant, who were burnt to death, castrated, or beheaded between 1885 and 1887 on the orders of Kabaka Mwanga II, the then King of Buganda. This photograph was taken in 1885, and less than one year later, many of those pictured would become martyrs for their faith. Celebrations are held annually at the Uganda Martyr Shrine Numagongo, Kampala, Uganda, the same shrine that Pope Francis visited in 2015 when he blessed the shrine's cornerstone. The theme of this year's celebration was The Truth Will Set You Free, and since Martyrs' Day is a public holiday for the country, it gave the chance for thousands of people to make the pilgrimage to the shrine, coming as far as Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and even other continents. The commemorative events began on May 22nd, when pilgrims walked across Uganda in a symbolic pilgrimage known as the Walk of Faith. Along the way, pilgrims stopped for prayer at the actual places of martyrdom of St. Denis Sebugawo, St. Ponciano Ngandwe, and St. Joseph Mukasa Balikudembe, as well as St. Athanasius Bazakita. The spiritual journey concluded with the celebration of Holy Mass, presided over by Bishop Joseph Antony Ziwa, the Bishop of the Kiinda Mitiana Diocese. Mass was celebrated at St. Mattia Malumba Church, built upon the spot where St. Mattia Malumba was put to death on May 30, 1886, also on the orders of King Kabaka Mwanga II. In his homily, Bishop Ziwa called upon all to emulate the martyrs to strengthen their faith and said, quote, Let us use these celebrations to reject social evils, to live a society that embraces peace and love. The event culminated on June 3rd with the celebration of a high mass accompanied by music, processions, and dance. The Christian faith that King Mwanga tried desperately to eradicate is now shared by over 84% of Ugandans. As Tertullian wrote in Apologeticus, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Christ said in Matthew 19, verse 14, let the little children come unto me. 
And that is just what Pope Francis did when he recently opened the doors of the Vatican for a special meeting with some 400 school children. The children represented various ethnicities, cultures, and religions and came from marginalized environments. Some of them were migrants and refugees. The journey to the Vatican City for these children began in Calabria in southern Italy. There all got aboard the Treno dei Bambini, that is, the children's train that carried them nearly 350 miles to St. Peter's train station. The children's train is an annual initiative of the Pontifical Council for Culture, and this year had its theme, Carried by the Waves, a reference to the dangerous sea route that many refugees take in a desperate attempt to reach safety in Europe, fleeing war, violence, or persecution. So far in 2016, over 46,000 refugees have reached the shores of Italy, with more than 2,300 dead or missing at sea, and another 700 drowning this week alone. In 2015, more than 1 million refugees entered Europe's borders, arriving in unseaworthy boats and navigating treacherous conditions. Approximately 35% of refugees entering Europe are children. During the special audience with the children, Pope Francis recounted the story of a Spanish rescue worker who had brought the Holy Father the life vest of a young migrant who drowned at sea. During the visit, a children's orchestra performed for the Holy Father while a choir sang Ode to Joy, showing that the power of music can transform lives. The children also presented Pope Francis with their drawings. Sadly, more than 200 million Christians are facing persecution in 105 countries, especially in countries like North Korea, Somalia, Syria, and Iraq, and many are fleeing for their lives. Please pray for our brothers and sisters of all ages, these suffering Christians who are persecuted and trying to flee life-threatening conditions with little to no local or international support. Hebrews 13 verse 3 asks us to always be mindful of the ill-treated as of yourselves, for you are also in the body. Friends Nick Marchesi and Lucas Patchett never guessed during their school days that they'd be spending so much time together in the future, doing laundry of all things. The two met at St. Joseph's Catholic College Gregory Terrace in Brisbane, Australia, and became fast friends. The school's motto is to serve God is to be wise. And true to the motto, service meant a lot to both of them. In fact, each had separately volunteered at the school's early morning city food van for homeless people. That shared experience later inspired the men to find a way to do more for their community when they decided to build a free mobile laundry unit for the homeless, knowing that a $6 laundromat fee can be totally out of reach for someone living on the streets. They took an old van and nicknamed it Sudsy, and then fitted it with a generator, water tanks, and two large washing machines and dryers. They then took it to the streets and began driving around town, offering clean clothes to those sleeping there. To their surprise, the two friends discovered that the very first person that they did laundry for was a man named Jordan, who had studied the same chemical engineering course at the same university as Lucas. It hit home hard that although you can be on what seems like a successful path, a few bad decisions could change everything in a heartbeat. The Laundry for the Homeless project took off, and Orange Sky now operates in 36 locations around the country of Australia, washing approximately 350 loads of laundry per week. Local businesses have made the effort possible, along with the help of the 270 volunteers that have now joined the ranks of Orange Sky. Marchesi and Paget have been honored with the title of the 2016 Young Australians of the Year, and when receiving the award, Paget spoke of the impact of the project, saying, We can restore respect, raise health standards, and be a catalyst for conversion. We have found a way to treat others how they want to be treated. In life, we can't go wrong when we follow Christ's golden rule to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Coming up next, we'll go up close with Dr. Alessandro Monteduro, National Director of the Catholic Organization Aid to the Church in Need Italy, to discuss a special event in Como, Italy that casts a light on the 200 million Christians facing persecution throughout the world for their faith. Corpus Christi. On the feast commemorating the institution of the Holy Eucharist, thousands celebrate with a grand Eucharistic procession led by Pope Francis starting at the Cathedral of the City of Rome. Mary's Month. 
We'll take you to a Marian shrine in Harissa, Lebanon, to experience how Our Lady is celebrated as she rises up above the clouds like a cedar of Lebanon. Did you like the program you just watched? Help Shalom World bring more programs like this to a global audience. Your support helps us share the peace of Christ with the world. Visit shalomworld.org forward slash donate. More headline news. This Jubilee Year of Mercy has been marked with many special events celebrated around the world, and from June 1st to the 3rd, it was our priests who were being remembered. In a Jubilee, it's a particular time of grace, so we, the priests, need a lot of grace as well to live our own vocation. And so that's why we need this, and we really need because uh, being a priest is not easy, as being a lay, a lay person, it's not easy either, uh, but... It's a, it's a big opportunity, uh, it's a big blessing to, to have these days uh, to gather as priests uh, and to present ourselves uh, to God, saying, here we are, wounded pastors that need to be healed. Uh, we want to learn from the word uh, of the Lord. We want to hear the Pope, we want to listen to his message, and we want to share our experiences, but particularly we want to celebrate the mercy, which is the biggest gift that we receive every single day from God. On Wednesday, some 6,000 priests from around the world came together for adoration, confession, and catechesis in various languages in Jubilee churches, providing the opportunity to join in fellowship with brother priests. It's amazing to know that my brother from Sri Lanka or my brother from Russia or whatever, Tonga, Solomon Islands, Australia or the US are living the same, maybe struggling with the same uh, problems and finding in God's mercy, uh, I mean, the, the healing for their lives. On Thursday, the Holy Father led a spiritual retreat, making stops in three major Jubilee churches, offering three separate meditations for his brother priests. And for those who weren't able to be in Rome, the events were televised publicly by the Vatican Television Center and streamed in different languages. The Holy Father's message bore the theme, The Good Shepherd, the priest as a minister of mercy and compassion, close to his people and servant to all. To be good ministers of mercy, we have to receive mercy first. And that's a big priority for this Jubilee. Mercy is part of why you become a priest, um, even if you don't put it in those terms. Uh, you become a priest to uh, share the love of Christ with others and to bring the sacraments and to, to just be part of this dynamism of love that God wants for his people. And mercy is at the core of that. We all are called for, to reconciliation and union with our God. And so uh, this Jubilee year has, even in my young priesthood, it has been something that has sort of given it a great boost of graces and joy. On the final day, Pope Francis celebrated Mass for the conclusion of the Jubilee on the 160th anniversary of the Feast of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, introduced in 1856 by Pope Pius IX. Friday of the Jubilee is actually the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and that's no mistake. And so the priesthood, as St. John Vianney said, the priesthood's the love and the heart of Jesus. And, and that is such a beautiful reality. As we meditate on the Sacred Heart, we find the priesthood, and we find unconditional and self-giving love. And that is uh, what it's all about. And that we need to be renewed in that. Um, anything that takes us away from the core, the heart of who we are, who Christ is calling us to be, it's time to set that aside and be renewed in the core of our call. There are approximately half a million Catholic priests in the world, and this Jubilee is a great reminder that as a church community, it is our responsibility to offer support, encouragement, and prayers to do what we can to nurture and pray for vocations to the priesthood. After Rome's iconic Trevi Fountain was bathed in red light recently to represent the blood spilt throughout the world by current Christian martyrs and to bring attention to their plight, this week a new light was shed on the situation, and this time in northern Italy. The 11th century Basilica of St. Abbondio in Como was illuminated in a red light in memory of the blood shed each day by Christian martyrs throughout the world. The Basilica of St. Abondio also contains the relics of two great martyrs persecuted for their faith, Saints Peter and Paul. 
The event was spearheaded by the Catholic organization Aid to the Church in Need, and the evening's events focused on the recounting of real-life testimonies of the horrific and widespread persecution of Christians. At the end of the evening, in front of the basilica lit with red, the Bishop of Como, Diego Coletti, addressed the crowds. Bishop Coletti had previously noted that, although most major news networks will not carry this event, quote, this must not discourage us, nor should it prevent us from doing everything possible to ensure people's consciences are enlightened. To do just that, we spoke to Alessandro Monteduro, the National Director of Aid to the Church in Need, Italy. This office is a foundation under the guidance of the Holy Father, which has existed for 69 years with 21 sites throughout the world, which in a few months will be 22, as we are opening a site in the Philippines. It has a mission to support the Church in places where the Church and the Christian community are persecuted, are in poverty or are suffering. We are deepening our efforts to support persecuted Christians, our brothers and sisters of the faith, on both a humanitarian and emergency level, who, for example, in the Middle East, Iraq and Syria, have been forced to leave everything because they refused to deny their faith in Christ. I have to say that I was so moved on my recent visit to Iraq when I entered a small space of only 15 square meters where today 9 to 10 people live, and in those small 15 square meters, I saw a cross and a Bible. It is something that renews hope in the hearts of each and every one of us. Many thanks to Mr. Montedura, who expressed that events like the one at the Trevi Fountain in Rome and St. Abondio Basilica in Como are meant to share a sense of hope of Christ with the world, even in the midst of suffering. Last week, our church celebrated the Feast of Corpus Christi, the feast that exalts the body and blood of Christ, truly present in the consecrated Eucharist. As a Catholic community, we hold a deep faith in the presence of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ in the Eucharist and memorialize His death and resurrection in the Holy Mass. With that knowledge comes a joy and enthusiasm to give witness to that faith and around the world, Eucharistic processions are held in countless towns and cities for the Feast of Corpus Christi. In Melbourne, Australia, over 500 people joined the men of Corpus Christi College Seminary at a Eucharistic procession after Mass that took them through the streets of the city with Christ in the Eucharist raised high under a century-old canopy. In Guadalajara, Mexico, hundreds of faithful, including many children, dressed in white to represent the purity of Christ, poured out for the Corpus Christi procession, stepping over beautiful flower petal carpets, which were prepared by the locals. We spoke to Father Krzysztof Zaroka, who said that in his home country of Poland, a Eucharistic procession occurs in every town after Mass and is followed by a family meal at home. And right here in Rome, Pope Francis led the annual procession from the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran to the Church of St. Mary Major, Father Zaroka shared what it was like to be part of the experience. What was really important for me, uh, this amount of people in the streets, uh, there, there was a lot of people who made this um, per, per, procession, and then there were people uh, that they uh, was uh, turning back from their work to home or just... Uh, uh, stop, uh, stopped on the uh, cr crosswalks, you know, and and uh, uh, look, looked what was happening, and uh, we all uh, were a part of this big event uh, to give the testimony that uh, Christ is our Lord. And for all those who are chance witnesses to Christ passing by in procession, it remains that one cannot see Christ and not be changed forever. Yet many wonder how it's possible to develop a great understanding of the Eucharist and knowledge of Christ's presence there. We spoke to a sister of the Servant Sisters of the Home of the Mother who shared how her community helps foster a love for the Eucharist, especially in their youth outreach. It's simply to try to put them in contact with Him. And so often during our, if we have retreats or activities, we always try to have, to set aside a time for Eucharistic adoration. And it's through, especially moments of silence with the Lord, 
that the youth can grow closer to Christ. Jesus gave us the profound gift of himself to fulfill the promise that he would be with us until the end of time. And as many saints realized, if only we partially understood the reality of the true presence of Christ, the Son of God Most High in the Eucharist, entering our hearts and souls, we would crawl on our knees to the altar of the Lord at every opportunity to partake in this source of infinite grace and nourishment for the soul, to experience the most intimate personal relationship with Christ that we can conceive of. To mark the end of the month of May, the month dedicated especially to Our Lady, Vatican employees and their families joined Pope Francis for a torchlight procession to the Vatican Gardens, culminating with the rosary in front of the Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes, where they prayed and sang the Litany of Loreto. There, Cardinal Angelo Camastri, the Vicar General of the Vatican City State, gave a meditation on the maternal love of Mary for her precious children. At Mass earlier that day, celebrating the Feast of the Visitation, Pope Francis proclaimed that the Church needs women who are courageous like Mary. Throughout May, Mother Mary was celebrated around the world and in the Middle East in Harassa, Lebanon, at the Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon. Thousands of Christians and even non-Christians flock there to honor her. <laughs> The foundation of this sanctuary, this shrine, especially, uh, the Muslim people come here to visit. Somebody comes to for tourism. Other people come to pray. Somebody come into the church to pray, to participate at our or prayers. It depends on uh, each person who come to visit. All of them have big respect for Mary. The majority of people, Christian people, come to confession. On Sundays, we have 12 masses. It means 20 hours of confession. During the month of May, since 1908, in the foundation, Lebanese people used to come, all the Christian people of Lebanon come to visit Mary. The Maronite pastor came to our basilic here. He consecrated Lebanon, all the Lebanon for Virgin Mary. It's a beautiful place where you can think and pray peacefully without anybody bothering you. To meet God and uh, feel God, and so God will protect my family. She is our mother, and uh, our wishes she make come true. We respect it, really, and we like it, and like to visit it every time we came to Lebanon. We have to come to Harissa. We'd like to ask for forgiveness all the time, and I hope she listened to us to give our prayers to God. I come here to enjoy with everything. We pray that Mother Mary lays her protective mantle over the church in Lebanon as we reflect on the words of St. Louis Marie de Montfort, we never give more honor to Jesus than when we honor his mother. All week long, you can keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, which is at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on Facebook on our Voice of the Vatican page. Keep checking our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice too. Email your questions, stories, and news to us at vov at shalomworld.org. This is Anne Schneibel sitting in for Ashley Nerona. On behalf of the entire crew of Voice of the Vatican, I wish you all a blessed week. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City. I will see you next time on Voice of the Vatican, from Rome to your home, only on Shalom World TV.